<laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hey, we don't know. Probably we might have seen whatever terrible thing it is you're saying. But praise the Lord. I hope you come to church expecting the night. The Lord is gracious. He is good. He is faithful. And look, He wants to minister to each one of us. He wants to touch us. He wants to change us. He wants to draw us closer to Him. He wants to separate us from the world. And he wants to move and act in each one of our lives and to have relationship with him. And he's there to do that every time we come into his presence. But you don't have to come to church to be in his presence. You Amen. need to be in his presence seven days a week, spend time in his word, pray, and let him grow you. Let him change you. Learn to trust in him alone. And praise the Lord. We're going to open up in prayer. And then uh, we're going to turn it over to Trish to do some praise and worship. And hopefully she will sing the songs in order this evening. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, we give you all the praise and the honor and the glory. Lord, I ask that you pour, pour out your anointing on Trish tonight as she brings the praise and worship. Pour out your anointing on me as we preach, Lord. Lord, I pray that you will remove the human element out of the way and you will be glorified. You will do the speaking and the preaching and the lifting up of your name. And we, Lord, I pray that you will bless the offerings that came in this morning and any offerings that come in this evening, Lord, that you will bless those that give, Lord, that death offering will go to the work of the ministry and it'll be used to glorify you and we ask it all in the mighty name of jesus amen and amen, amen. amen. you're okay honey you're a strong woman in the lord ha ha he said in the right order and that's referring sherry wasn't here this morning i was in charge of communion this morning and to me I mean, it's the Lord's Supper. We do it in remembrance of Him, right? Right. I don't see where it's set in stone. you got to do the bread first, you know? It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the wine first. Well, the juice. So, anyway, I mean, hey, I gave it my best shot. You did excellent, excellent, Trish. Excellent. <laughs> um, other than that. All right, Ron, I put the mouse on that side, and it's already on there, so you have to do this click. Oh, I get to click this time. Ron, start the music. He had a fight oh, with the yeah. mouse this morning. I got things out of order. He was fighting the mice. Get that good. Praise the Lord. Let's enter into the into worship and just praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to Thank <laughs> you. 
can trust you with every area of our life.
walk with the Lord, your walk with the Lord is as close as you want it to be. True. Now, your walk with the Lord is as close you like as you I want have. it to be. I'm not trying to be unkind. I don't mean that in an unkind way. But if you want to have a closer walk with the Lord, spend more time with Him. Spend more time talking with Him. Spend more time reading His Word. Spend more time meditating upon Him. Yes. Upon the Word. Yes. And you will get closer to Him. He, listen, if you want to know what's wrong with your faith or your walk, why it's falling short, while you're struggling, he, if you ask Him, He will tell you. He, will, he won't turn you away. Tonight we're going to be in Matthew chapter 12, verses 15 through 21. And we're going to, a title tonight, A Bruised Reed and Smoking Flax. And that has a double meaning, but we're going to really hone in on, on it being symbolic of a feeble believer. A believer who is struggling to live right for the Lord, who's fallen short, but a bruised reed... And, and a smoking flax. And you're going to see that he's not going to, he's not going to break, throw away, or quench a bruised reed or a smoking flax. He's going to fix it up. That's what he does. If we keep trusting in him and putting our faith in him, he's going to keep doing a work in us. So Matthew 12, 15 through 21 is where we're going to be. And let's go ahead and open up in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you all the praise and the honor and the glory this afternoon, this evening, Lord. Lord, we just pray, Lord, that you will have your way. Lord, that you will speak. That you will minister. That you will touch us. And we ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus. Listen. Amen. The two, two, two keys to start getting your walk with the 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 Lord right, and it would really greatly help every believer. Number one, get your faith and trust completely in Christ and what He's done at the cross. The second thing, get baptized in the Holy Spirit. And if you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, or if you have been, excuse me, get refilled. Because you need to be refilled. Once that anointing, you know what that anointing is? It's the power of God working through us to minister to other people. And once it's spent, we need to be refilled again. Not rebaptized. We're baptized in it. We need to be refilled again. So, keep your faith right. Get baptized in the Holy Spirit. And, and consistently get real refilled in the Holy Spirit. And you will start beginning to find 
that joy and that power of God working in your life again that you've been missing for a while, if you've been missing it. But today, like I said, Matthew 12, 15 through 21, a bruised reed and smoking flax. And I'm going to read it straight through. But when Jesus knew it, all right, this is talking about the plot of the Pharisees and the Herodians to kill him. That's what it's talking about. When he knew that, he withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all, and charged them that they should not make him known, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him. And he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break. A bruised reed shall he not break. And smoking flax shall he not quench. Till he set forth judgment unto victory, and in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Praise your name for your word. You know, when we go back to verse 15, it says, But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from hence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. Listen. When it says he healed them all, that all is emphatic. It means that not one single person went without healing. Everyone was made whole. He is the only one that can make us whole. That he made them, everyone, great multitudes followed him. And that's part of the reasons that the Pharisees hated him so much was because great multitudes followed him. They were envious of his popularity. But he wasn't boasting about himself like they did. We're going to see that as we continue on here. But the crowds that followed Christ, Christ threatened uh, the position of, the, of their leadership, of the Pharisees' leadership. You know, if he wanted to, at any given time, you know, there were so many that followed Christ, he could have caused an insurrection. He could have caused an insurrection against the Jewish establishment or even Rome. There were so many that followed him, at least in the first two years of his ministry. Or two and a half years of his ministry. Listen, their leadership, the Pharisees' leadership, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, uh, was a man-appointed leadership. It wasn't God-appointed leadership. Man-appointed leadership always opposes the work of the Holy Spirit. It will always oppose the work of God. Listen, and we know the Holy Spirit's always going to do something that lifts up Christ. Always, He's always going to lift up Christ. Listen, you can't say because a church is big or because a church is small, it's of God. You can't, it doesn't matter how big it is or how small it is. What matters is what is being preached and taught, who is being glorified. There's a major ministry that has recently fallen. because, And, and there's preachers I know besides myself and better preachers than myself that have been saying it for years. They're not preaching the truth. They're not preaching the truth. Their music is anointed by demon spirits and not by the Holy Spirit. And guess what? It's come out in the wash. And people and Christians are acting shocked. But Christians are acting shocked that I know for a fact. Heard it from other preachers that said this. But they would say, you're just being too harsh. You're being religious. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't know if it's a work of God or not. Yes, I do. If Christ isn't being glorified, period, 100%, it's not a work of the Holy Spirit because that's the Holy Spirit's job. 
If I, he is always going to try to make us like Christ. And glory to God. Thank God for him. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. You know the first thing about the Holy Spirit. You know the it's power. That he gives us power. Power to be a greater witness. Power to live more like Christ. Right. I'm getting ahead of myself. But let's keep on going. Verse 16. It says. And charge them that they should not. Make him known. You know, he would not allow the, the fame of his miracles. He would not allow the fame of his miracles to hinder his purpose of uh, his purpose of offering up himself. Hinder. Yeah. He said hindle. <laughs> hindle, hinder, it's all the same in hit from the stick language. <laughs> you know, his purpose of offering up himself as a sacrifice for sin. And, you know, the latter, the latter was his real mission to, to redeem mankind, to offer himself as a, a, a sacrifice for sin. You know, this spiritual attitude demonstrated by Christ is very much needed in the church today. It's very much needed in the church today. The, not to make him known, you know, and he charged them that, that they should not make him known. He wanted his preaching, the word of God, in the miracles to speak for themselves. They would speak for themselves. They would glorify the Father. Right. They would glorify the Father. We need this attitude in the church today where it's about glorifying God the Father and God the Son. And it's not about glory, glorifying the preacher or the church or the denomination or the fellowship. Or look at me. Look what, look what miracle we prayed into existence. Or look what happened when we laid hands on them. Listen, we're need, forget that. I might pray for you and you're healed and I lay hands on you or someone gets saved. It is God that did the work, not me. Amen. I can't save nobody. The more that man, the more that man, the more that flesh is lifted up, the less the Holy Spirit will move and operate. Listen, if you, I don't mean to be unkind, but hear me out. We need to know this. If you're going to a church and they're lifting up the preacher, if they're lifting up what they're doing, and there's moving in operation and there's certain things that's happening, it's not the Holy Spirit is doing it if Christ isn't being lifted up. See, God has got to be lifted up. Christ has got to be lifted up. What he's done at Calvary has got to be lifted up. Not the preacher, not the church, not the man, not the miracle. The Holy Spirit won't even talk about himself. Right. Oh my, you're, you're joking, preacher. No, I'm not joking. The Holy Spirit ain't going to run around lifting himself up. He never does. And we need the Holy Spirit. And you're going to hear that tonight, that we need the Holy Spirit. We need him desperately. But the surest way to quench the Holy Spirit is to start preaching false doctrine Start glorifying man or money or false doctrine and forget off, leave off glorifying Jesus Christ. Right. Leave off glorifying God the Father. Verse 17. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying. Listen. That it might be fulfilled. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. Whatever Christ did and said, fulfilled the word of God. Everything that Christ did and said was in fulfillment of the word of God. He didn't do anything that wasn't fulfilling the word of God. Well, One thing that he was portraying according to the word was that he was meek and lowly in heart. That he was meek and lowly in heart. We're going to, all right. That's one thing that he was portraying. Verse 18. Behold my servant. He was God the Father's servant. He was not only God the Father's servant. He was God in the flesh. You know, and because he was God the Father's servant, the Pharisees treated him disrespectfully because he came as a servant. Yet this servant 
belong to God. This servant belonged to God and their poor treatment of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God in the flesh, led them to reap a bitter harvest. Is what happened. So, behold my servant whom I have chosen, God's servant, God chose them. <clears throat> Not man, man didn't cho choose him, and because man didn't choose him, religious man would reject him right. out of his own people. My beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. God the Father's beloved, and his soul was well pleased because he did what the Father wanted him to do. He didn't stray. He fulfilled the righteousness of the law. He was sinless. He was sinlessly perfect. The only one that could do so. He gave his life willingly. Even though he said if it was possible. If, it, if it's your will, take this cup from me. But nevertheless, your will be done. And he was obedient to the will of the Father unto death. And who... In whom my soul is well pleased. You know, that should be our desire. Our goal, too, as a believer, that we please God the Father. I will put my spirit upon him. God the Father is saying this to Jesus. In Isaiah, I will put my spirit upon him. I will put the Holy Spirit upon him. We're going to get to that here in a minute. And he shall show judgment. And he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. Listen, Christ exemplified and personified the servant spirit. He exemplified and personified it. Who are we supposed to model ourselves after? Who are we supposed to be a reflection of? Jesus Christ. You know, he did it as no other, showing us truly that he was meek and lowly in heart. Being meek and lowly in heart is one of the hallmarks are one of the true signs of true Christianity. But it is portrayed so little by most of us. We're still so full of ourselves and our wants and our needs. Now listen, I'm not being unkind because he has to deal with the pastor too. Alright, so understand, I'm not here beating somebody up tonight that's sitting here or tuning in by Facebook. He's dealing with all of us tonight. We all wear this flesh. <laughs> but this is portrayed so little by most of us. And it needs to be portrayed by us. We need to be meek and lowly in heart. We need to be Christ-like. It says, I have chosen. We need to let God to choose our course. We need, we need to let God. Jesus surrendered to the course of his life. God's plan and purpose and course for his life. He surrendered to that. God chose it for him. And he walked in it. We need to let God choose our course too. Too often we choose our own course. And as usual, we reap the bitter harvest of choosing our own course. Uh-oh. Preacher, you're meddling now. No, I'm preaching the word. I'm preaching what the Lord put on my heart to preach. If we choose our own course, we're going to have far too many bitter harvests. And if we don't choose God's course. I'm a witness. <laughs> <laughs> to do God's will. Listen, it's to please Him. You want to please God? Be in His will. Do His will. Forget your will. Forget your plans and your desires. God's will comes before our will, or it should. And it says in the scripture, I will put my spirit upon Him. God is saying, in Isaiah, and it's being quoted here in Matthew, I will put my spirit upon him. I want to read two verses. Now let's, no, yeah, two verses. Let's read Psalm 45, 7. Psalms 
Psalm 45, 7 reads like this. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your fellows. Now I want you to know this. That this is, this psalm is about the king. Messiah's majesty and power. This psalm is talking about Christ. And again, 45 7, Psalm 45 7, you love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your fellows. Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit to a greater degree than any other person has ever been or ever will be. When was Jesus anointed by the Holy Spirit? When he come up out of that water after John the baptized, John the Baptist baptized him. The Holy Spirit landed upon him and rested upon him and came upon him. And he had the anointing of the Holy Spirit for the rest of his ministry. Look at John. Keep your finger in Matthew 12 there. We're going to flip over to John 3. The Gospel of John. Is it 3.34? Let me see. Yes. John 3.34. For he whom God has sent speaks the word, words of God. It's talking about Jesus. For God gives not the Spirit by measure unto him. We have it by measure. We have means he gives us a certain amount of the Holy Spirit, a certain level of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But Jesus had the whole thing. He had the whole thing. Now listen, Christ was anointed by the Holy Spirit above all his fellows and without measure. Jesus, God in the flesh, who was perfectly sinless. He was God in the flesh. He was perfectly sinless. If Jesus needed the Holy Spirit, what does it say about us? What does it say about... Now, just let God deal with you on that question. Let the Holy Spirit deal. If Jesus needed the Holy Spirit, and evidently He did... Or it wouldn't have happened. What does it say about us? As believers. Let's look at Acts. Chapter 1 verses 4 and 5. Acts chapter 1 verses 4 and 5. And this is what it says. And being assembled together with them. Commanded them. Commanded that, oh, you don't talk about commands and laws, and that's legalism. No, it's not. Not if you've been transformed, it's not legalism. Not if you got a new heart. Not if the law of God is written on tablets of flesh, and your mind has been renewed. And now you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. And being assembled together with them, commanded them. That's not a suggestion, folks. Oh, if you feel like it. No, he commanded them. That they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. What is the promise of the Father? It starts in Joel chapter 2. But the promise of the Father was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Which said he, you have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water. But you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days hence. And that did happen. That happened on the day of Pentecost. Is when it happened. Now here's the great debate. Here's the great debate. Does that command apply to believers today? Does that command apply to believers today? That's the great debate. Charismatics even debated. Uh, evangelicals debated. And that was for then. It's not for now. Listen. 
The latter days, the latter rain has not ceased. The outpouring is still for the day, I believe. There is nothing in the new covenant that says that it's over. He wasn't the, he's not the great I was. He's not the, he's the great I am. He, he was, he's not the, he, he's not the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. Was the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. He is the baptizer in the yeah. Holy Spirit. Well, this wasn't the only time it happened either. Now, what is the reason for the baptism in the Holy Spirit? Power. Power, power number one, to be a better witness unto Christ. That is to share the gospel, but it is also to power to live a more consecrated life towards Him. And even with the Holy Spirit, you are have you you are human. You have it in measure. You will not be perfectly sinless, but you do need more of God's power. Every one of us needs more God's power to be consecrated and live for Him. Why would we, why would we want to, something that is in God's Word, brush it aside and not want nothing to do with it? And it's, it's for our benefit. Right. It's for our benefit. It's for more power of God working in us to do in us what we can't do, to work through us in a way that we can't do anything in our own flesh. Listen, if it's the Word of God, whether we understand it or not, we have to accept it and stand on it. Now, I don't mean to be unkind. I'm not trying to be unkind when people say that it's past. No, it hasn't. No, it hasn't. There's nothing in the scriptures that says it's past. And to say so is wrong. And what is even worse, for somebody to stand up behind a pulpit and say it's a work of the devil, listen, you're bordering, if you're not blaspheming the Holy Spirit, you're right there. Repent. That would count as blessed. You, if you're not there, you, you're right there. You better repent. Listen, that's one thing if you don't get it. Right. But I'm going to tell you something else, folks. And it grieves me to say this, but the Holy Spirit wants me to say this. When you credit the Holy Spirit for moving and operating in a false way, when Christ isn't being glorified, that's as close to blasphemy as saying it's a work of the devil. Alright? That's blasphemy too. Uh, he's going to glorify Christ. He won't move and operate in any other way that is not bringing glory to Jesus Christ. There's a lot of charismatic, so-called spirit-filled Pentecostals that say things are of the Holy Spirit that's not of the Holy Spirit. I don't mean to be unkind, but the worst heresies, the worst doctrines come out of our circle. I'm not talking about world evangelism fellowship, but I'm talking about those that call themselves spirit-filled, Pentecostal, charismatic. You know what? There is... This cracks me up. Huh? We, we're all supposed to be in the Word of God for ourselves so we can discern right. false doctrine from true doctrine. What is right and what is not. So the Holy Spirit can say, this is right, this is wrong. Mm -hmm. And you've got preachers out there who say they're, they're Pentecostal, they're Spirit-filled, and they'll say something. You shouldn't quote somebody like Charles Spurgeon or Vody Bauckham or Greg Locke because, you know, they're not Spirit-filled. Listen. If you read your Bible for yourself, you would be able to discern what is exactly right, what they're saying, and what is not. Now, you quote preachers that you say are spirit-filled, that are far worse in their doctrines than them men I just mentioned. You will quote 
uh, Kenneth Copeland. You will quote Jesse Duplantis. You will quote Stephen Verte. You will quote, oh, uh, who else? I don't know. Name them. Uh, Todd White. Huh? Joel Osteen. Joel Osteen. Joel Osteen. And you will think because they say they're spirit filled, they're telling you the truth. Hogwash. Right. Mm -hmm. Those men, there's men of God who might be evangelical, who might not be baptized as, as uh, in the Holy Spirit, who might be labeled as Reformed or Calvinist now or in the past that had more of anointing than those clowns I just mentioned before that. Look at Billy Graham. He saved a lot of people. <laughs> Because their faith is in Christ right. and not in themselves. Right. Look at, don't tell me you shouldn't write that and you shouldn't quote that and you shouldn't do. That. Let me tell you something. You're quoting clowns. You're told, you're you're quoting <laughs> Satan's ministers. You you quote Satan's ministers, and the New Covenant points that out. And you got a problem with a born again man of God glorifying Jesus. Shame on you. <laughs> Shame on you. Repent. Repent. I got off track there, but Lord, thank you for leading me in that direction. Thank you for leading me. Verse 19. He shall not strive nor cry. He's not going to demand his rights. Neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. He's not. Pro Christ wasn't promoting himself. He was not promoted himself. Now listen, he corrected the Pharisees' error and denounced them, but he did not defend himself either. He did not promote himself. There's people that have attacked me. And you know, this is hard for me because I want to defend myself. But the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God has told me more than once, don't defend yourself. Don't defend yourself. At this time, the people have attacked me for what I believe. And the Spirit of God will say, don't defend yourself. It, I'll tell you to correct the doctrine if I want you to, but don't defend yourself. And boy, that's a hard thing for this old hick. That's a hard thing for this country boy. Because boy, I, you know what? I'm the first one that wants to fight when somebody attacks me. I was raised that way. I'm not saying it was right, but it was part of who I am. Something that God has had to set me free from. But he didn't defend himself. He didn't promote himself. He allowed his preaching and his miraculous works to speak for themselves, which is contrary to today's self-promotion, which uses the ways of the world. Look at Hillsong, they're beautiful music. I mean, that's the only thing that carried them. But it's music that didn't even have exactly. theology in it. Yeah, that's true. Most of it. And you know what? I know, like I said, preachers have been saying it for years, but we was the self-righteous religious ones. Oh, and now they can't believe it. Now that the world has exposed them, yeah. oh, oh, but when preachers <laughs> exposed them, it was new religious. <laughs> well, you, you got a problem. You'd rather, you'll take the word of the world media and not the word of God's truly call. Something's wrong. Something's wrong with you. That's all. I'll leave it at that. Verse 20. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench. Even though Israel rejected him, he will not give up on Israel. And it's the same for a believer. A believer, you know what? He won't give up on a believer if a believer's failing, if a believer's falling, if a believer's weak, if a believer's stumbling, if the believer still trusts in him. He's not going to quit on you. If you don't give up, he won't give up. If you don't quit, he won't quit. If you don't quit believing, he's not going to let you go. He's not going to let you go. I don't care what the self-righteous say. If you keep believing, He's going to hold on to you. He's going to carry you. His Word says He'll never leave you nor forsake you. His Word says His mercies are new each morning. He will never leave you nor forsake you. 
If there's a problem with our faith, our walk with Him, ask Him. Ask Him. When we're falling short, He will answer such a prayer. He will answer a prayer just like that. And in His name shall the Gentiles trust. His name means Savior. We trust in Him and we'll be saved. I want to read a really short thing about the... About the it's better... I really felt led to read this out of the commentary about the about the reed and the flax. Read. Listen. The bruised reed and the smoking flax. This is from Brother Swagger's commentary, Book of Matthew, chapter 12, verse 20. And I'm going to read a short little bit here. One cow. Verse 20 has a double meaning. Verse 20, I'll read it again to you. It reads as such, a bruised reed shall not he shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench. Now listen to this. This is good. Especially the second part of it. The second part where we get here. Where am I supposed to be at? Did I flip the page? Did I lose my page? I lost my page. What page am I supposed to be on? Over here. There I am. Alright. Christ, number one. Christ would endure the discordance of the bruised reed and the offensiveness of the smoking flax, i.e., the un unbelief and rebellion of Israel, but only up to the day that he would bring forth judgment unto victory. In that day would the bruised reed be broken and the smoking flax quenched, which they were. It is impossible to produce melody with a bruised reed. And the smell of a smoking wix is unendurable. Such was Israel, and such is man. Grace endures these for a time. But judgment, as the scripture here plainly says, is certain to eventually fall upon them. Now number two, the bruised reed and the smoking flax speak of and symbolize the feeble believer. And I've been a feeble believer in my walk. I have been. This proclaims Christ's treatment of such as marked by long-suffering and gentleness. Consequently, the actions of the church should be identical. They should be long-suffering and they should be gentle. This was carried through by the Apostle Paul in his statement concerning a man who would not repent but insisted on being disobedient to the Word of God. He said, meaning Paul said, And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. However, then he said, then Paul said, Yet count him not as an enemy. Count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Correct him as a brother and break fellowship with him until he repents. But don't count him as your enemy. You still count him as your brother. You can see that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. A reed was a type of plant which grew in abundance in the marshes of Israel. It was hollow, and after being cut, could easily be notched and made into a whistle or flute. Also, it was delicate and would bruise or break easily. Inasmuch as they grew in abundance, it was easier to throw away the makeshift musical instrument after it was bruised and make a new one rather than attempting to repair it. By using the bruised reed as an example, Jesus proclaims that he would not throw away the weak believer, but would repair him. The weak believer who fails. If you keep believing, he's not going to throw you away. He's going to repair you. Glory to God. Listen, the the... Something that we need to get about the gospel. 
It saves us from our past sins, our present sins, and our future sins. It's there in place. So when we do fail now, what He does want us to keep the moral law. But if we fail, the gospel is there to keep us right with God. We have the righteousness of Christ imputed to us. We can't earn that. We can't merit that. But it's there to keep us. It's there to keep us from being discarded. For He won't give up on us. Because of Christ His Son died on that cross. And we will keep believing He will repair us. He won't throw us away. Praise God. As well, the smoke and flax consisted of a wick which floated in an open lamp. If the oil is used up or the wick is not trimmed, it will smoke, giving no light, but rather soot on the lamp. That sounds like a feeble believer in the church, don't it? Christ declares that rather than quench it, rather than quench it, rather than put it out, rather than throw it away, He will replenish the oil and trim the wick in order that it may again burn brightly. Hallelujah. He will replenish the oil. He will fill it with His Spirit. He will trim the wick. He will purge you the dregs and the dross and purify you that you may burn brightly again. You are here for a reason. Tonight, you're here hearing this message by Facebook or right here for a reason. You're alive for a reason. He's not done with you. He's not done with me. He's not done with you. Do you hear me? You're here for a reason. You might want to give up on yourself. You might want to say you got nothing to offer. You might say, I'm too tired. You're too tired. You're right. In your own strength. In your own strength, you are too weak. You need the Holy Ghost. You need to be refilled. You need to be baptized. You need the power of God. You need that oil. You need His power. And understand, He ain't done with you. He's going to clean you up. He's going to repair you. He's going to trim you up. He's going to refill you so that you can burn brightly, so you can be a reflection of Him for His glory. And He's going to do it, not because you're good enough. He's going to do it for His name's sake. Right. Right. He's going to take us foolish things, us weak things, us base things. Huh? And He's going to use us. Glory to God. Hallelujah. If you will believe, if you will surrender, if you will trust in Him, He will do it. He wants to do it. Are you ready for that tonight, church? Are you ready for that? Are you ready to surrender? Are you ready to let Him use you? With every eye closed and every head bowed. Lift your hands to the Lord, please. Heavenly Father, we just come to you right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that you will pour out your spirit here tonight. Lord, I pray that on Facebook, your spirit will go through Facebook and you will pour out your spirit on those who turn in. Tune in, Lord. Lord, I pray those that are baptized, that you will baptize them in the Holy Spirit. Those who have been filled and need to be refilled, Lord, I pray that you will fill them in the glorious and mighty name of Jesus. The only, the only requirement is that you be saved and that you receive it by grace through faith and you yield your tongue when he gives you the word. Heavenly Father, just touch him, Lord. Touch him, Lord. Touch him, Lord. Lord, we thank you for your word. Repair us, Lord. Trim us, Lord. Refill us, Lord. We need your power. The church needs your power in the mighty and glorious name of Jesus. Lord, let it be. Let it be in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise your name. Hallelujah.